Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you. If you are a new listener, welcome to the program. Welcome to the conversation. And there's a couple things we ask you to do. Please subscribe wherever you're listening. So that way you can get the latest updates, the latest episodes. And then also, I will beg, I'm not bashful. Give us five stars if you like what we're doing. It helps us for placement in the app stores. If you're a returning listener, we want to say thank you. And then we, a new thing that we do is we recognize where people are listening in different cities. So I'd like to welcome and thank those in Hamden, Connecticut in the United States. Thank you for listening in. You know, the show is listened to in over 500 cities worldwide, and we are in 32 countries. Uh, those cities are in 32 countries, six continents. Now, if I could figure out how to market to the penguins, and probably more important, recharge their cell phones, we'd probably have uh, listeners on that last continent. All right, so glad to have you in the program. For those returning listeners, I say thank you. We're one of the fastest growing uh, podcasts out there on a global basis with users, like we said, all over the world. And that's because of you and then also our great guests. So thank you very much. The last thing of the um, housekeeping, please stop by and check on the site, the website for the program. You know, when we interview our guests, we get to talk about lots of things, but we only scratch the tip of the iceberg. So we have their profiles on our website. We have links to their digital assets and you can learn more about them because the stories are interesting, but you know, in the time we do our episodes, we just don't get to it all. So we want to say thank you for um, stopping in and listening. There are over 2.4 million podcasts in the world with about 120 million episodes. So there's a lot of choices. And so we, we thank you for coming back. All right. Uh, you know, our show is all about people's stories, interesting people doing interesting things. And we've got another one of those today. I always tell people I have too many interests for just one lifetime. But the biggest problem I have is that there's another discovery around every corner. And we have one of those discoveries today. Interesting topics. When I reached out to Booker for the show, this is one of the most unique topics that we have uh, had. And I think it's going to be a fun story. So I want to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's a mom, which is an eternal role. It's uh, something that you just don't ever get away from. So that's most important as a mom. She's a wife. Uh, an educator spends a lot of time teaching people and helping people learn about what she's doing. Um, she's a birth doula, which I don't understand anything about that. That's a new guy thing. So we're going to explore that. And then this is the thing that caught my eye. Um, she's a fertility um, obst obstetric. I can't I could say that right. She's acupuncturist. So, well, I stumbled through that one. So uh, she's going to have to help us learn a little bit about that. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Nava Carmen. Nava, how are you this morning? Hi, we're afternoon here in the UK. Thank you for having me. Yes. Now I stumbled through that description on the fertility. So you, can you help me with that? So my listeners are not sitting there scratching their heads. Well, to be fair, Rex, you're navigating through three different accents that I have, Right. And then we're going to the fourth for America. So I'm Australian. I've been living in England for over 20 years and I went to an American school for some of my education. So it's fertility and obstetric acupuncturist and herbalist. Okay, so obstetric. Obstetric, exactly. Helping people get pregnant and then the journey to live birth. Fantastic. You know, I had, um, I'm excited to talk about this because I know you, you understand a lot about this. I had a daughter that had a um, miscarriage and uh, excited to learn about what you do in, in that space and stuff. So, um, however, before we get to uh, all the stuff that you're doing, we want to understand your story. You know, success does not fall out of the sky. Uh, a few months ago, um, here where I live, we had um, parts of an airplane fall out of the sky, United Airlines uh, flight, and then parts landed about three blocks from my house. But that doesn't happen to people with success. Success is a journey. So um, we want to help people understand how you got to doing the amazing things that you're doing today. So let's go back in time. All right. Now I have a long list. Don't worry about writing it down because I'll, I'll get you. I'll, I'll ask these questions. Um, we want to know where you were born. Obviously, uh, you've got an interesting journey from that. We also know, want to know where you were raised because that's different many times. Uh, we had a, a guest on the show uh, about a couple months back, 
Ellie Soja, who moved 63 times by the time she was 15. So uh, where you're raised has some impact, okay? We want to know about your family life. So, you know, your, if you have siblings, if you have siblings that survived your harassment, your parents, okay? So what did they do as you were growing up and, and if they're still with us? Because parental influence is huge. And in all the hundreds of interviews that I've done, I kind of see three buckets of that. One is the super supportive set of parents. So they're just there involved, engaged, and just the launch pad for success. The next one is sort of what I would call the semi non-participatory um, parenting, where they were so busy eking out an existence and a life. Well, they were there and they were loving, they just didn't have as much time to invest in their children. And then the last bucket's the one I don't like, but it uh, creates a lot of success. Um, a, an environment of struggle. So there's, whether there's abuse or poverty or broken homes or just, you know, whatever it happened to be. And that can be a launching tool to say, hey, I don't want to be anything like that. Okay. So uh, that was a long ramble. We also want to know your education. Okay. So, you know, where did you get some of your background, your experience? Um, some key pivotal points along the way. You know, we don't have to go into minutia of every little job you've ever had, but but pivot points, things that moved you to a next level. So, uh, and then we'll talk about the stuff you're doing today, all of this fertility, good stuff, and your educate as an educator and all those good things. And so if you could, Nava, take us back to the beginning, where were you born? I was born in Melbourne, Australia. Okay. And I'm Jewish, which uh, is an important thing to mention because it informs some of the other questions that I suspect you're going to ask me. Melbourne, okay. Australia, is a very tight-knit post-Holocaust community. And so within the Jewish community, I was born and raised in a very particular way. My mom is, um, was the first Jewish baby born in Holland after World War II, and her parents were in kind of an Anne Frank type situation in the war. So my upbringing and my experience within the community I grew up in was very much informed by that experience and okay. a very uh, quite insular experience. I hadn't met anybody who or really got to know anyone who wasn't Jewish, and in fact, wasn't white, until we moved to the UK when I was 12. So okay. It gives you some of the idea of the scope of the tiny little world I grew up in and how life has changed now, where I now work in multicultural London and have devoted a great big part of my practice to supporting genderqueer and the trans community and their fertility and reproductive rights. So sure. that changes a lot. Um, I, I guess I wasn't aware. I was maybe a typical American and not understanding uh, Australian history. How big is the, or, or was when after post-Holocaust, is the Jewish community, community down there? I can't give you numbers anymore. Sure. But certainly it is a, it's one of the biggest in the world outside of the United States and of course, Israel. Okay, fantastic. That's great to know. Um, we'll learn something every day. Okay, so you mentioned that you moved to, okay, let's ask this question. Do you have siblings? I do. I have a younger sister okay. who's a corporate lawyer, very different job than me. Yes, very different. What, how many years apart are you? Four, four years. Four. I'm the older of the two of us. Okay, okay, fantastic. How was your relationship growing up with your sister? I would say that fractious would be an underestimation of what it was like, but we have both had parents who supported us having therapy as part of our growing journey. And actually having both had a therapeutic relationship um, and then come back together and had new tools to talk about and reevaluate our relationship has been huge. So now she lives down the road from me and best of friends. Great. That's good to hear. Now, what did your parents do as you were growing up? So mom started as a social worker, supported my dad, um, who had um, gotten kicked out of university because of his protests against the Vietnam War. So was working <laughs> retail at the time. And then <laughs> as his career grew, she decided to be a homemaker. So that was what she did. She raised us. And um, my dad has been in all sorts of jobs, but um, venture capital, mostly in direct marketing, worked all over the world, which is how we then came to move and to live in the UK. Do you remember much of your time back in, in Melbourne in Australia or do you I have? Do. Okay. What was yeah. the big, what was the biggest difference between Australia and London or the UK? Oh my goodness. The weather, the <laughs> friendliness and openness of people. Like I, we chat um, and English people are, are rather more reserved. So 
I have had to tone down the chat over the years to be socially appropriate. You know, that is interesting. I used to work for a company that was um, European headquarters is in London. I love visiting London, but there were a couple of things that I always just kind of got. Number one, as an American, we like ice water, right? And you just like ice water. And you'd ask for ice water in a restaurant and they'd bring you like a glass with one little cube in it because in, in London, who wants a cold drink, right? I mean, you know, that's funny. And then two, just the, um, I guess it would be a little bit of standoffishness to the culture. You know, they're a little more introverted, you know, less extrovert like most, you know, I'm making huge generalizations here. So, but um, the weather, no, I'm sorry. I, I live out and I live in Colorado. It's bright and sunny here. Uh, I just, the constant rain and drizzle and cloud. No, no, thank you. So great. Um, what else? Is there anything else that you really remember between the two, um, you know, cultures? There is a very different light in Australia. It still feels like home to me. I think I was there long enough that I still feel Australian, even though I've been here longer than I was ever there. Obviously, sure. I go back to visit family. But there's a quality of light there and a smell to the place of eucalyptus trees and the sounds of the birds, which are very the dawn chorus in Australia. It's completely different to here. So there are kind of touchstones that are very visceral, um, that really stay with me. Like the ringtone on my phone is the dawn chorus, which is why I know. So there are things that I do carry with me and that I very much feel connected to that part of the world. That's awesome. Um, when you moved to London, did you move into another Jewish community or were you a little more spread out and not in such a tight community? So much more spread out. In fact, um, we weren't allowed to join the Jewish schools in the UK when we moved here because my parents couldn't produce the original copy of their marriage contract. So they had a copy of it signed by the chief rabbi of Australia, but that wasn't acceptable. And I'm very thankful for it because it launched us into the world. So I ended up at an American school. Oh, wow. And that was full of other expats and full of people of different sizes and colors and ethnicities and experiences and that, you know, no looking back after that. You can't stuff someone back into a box. Yeah. You know, uh, for those who haven't visited London or spending time there, it's an extremely international city. You have people from all over the world there. I mean, you know, it's somewhat like in New York. Um, you have Indian communities, you have Russian communities, you have all kinds of communities in, um, again, in, in London. I can remember when I used to spend a lot of time there, you know, you'd go on the north end of Piccadilly and you'd find the most amazing Indian restaurants and, uh, you know, a community there. So it's a great city. It's a great city. Like I said, if you could fix the weather, it might be one of the top uh, international cities in the world. All right. So uh, you get to London, you know, you're 12. Um, what was that experience like? Did you, you know, that's a pretty formative time. You're starting to enter into the sort of the pre-puberty or those types of things. And there's lots of different social pressures and stuff like that. So give me a little glimpse on like that was what it was like for a 12 year old to move to London. I was grateful to be here. I felt the restriction of where I was. And of course, when you come to London and you're living in the middle, you've got access to the tube system, to the subway system, as you call oh, it. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. it's awesome. And that just opens up a whole world for a young teen to be able to get out and explore and see and experience. And, you know, we're, we're hop, skip and jump away from Soho and there's theatre here and there's yes. galleries and music and all the sort of things that are accessible when you're, that age in this country, whereas not so accessible in suburban Australia. Sure. That's so a, quite a different experience. I would bring home keychains and small signs and stuff to say, mind the gap, because it, I understood what it meant in London, but I was always talking about the gap in between success and being busy. So <laughs> uh, in the United States, I was translating that uh, mind the gap to something different than <laughs> look out the front be a hole between the, uh, you know, the rail card and the, and the platform. So anyway, um, so you get to there. What was your education like at that point in time once you got to London? So education was the international baccalaureate system. And then I okay. moved back into the British system for the last two years of school. We get what's called A-levels. And yep. that allowed me to go to a British university. Okay. Um, that, how, was, how was that experience kind of doing the high school thing in, the, in London? Amazing. It was amazing. And then that transition, I didn't, 
I said it's amazing. I didn't go to school very much toward the end of my career. Actually, I was not well. And that's part of the journey that sent me off where I have been now. Mm -hmm. I had ME when I was in those last two years of school, chronic fatigue syndrome. And at that time, it was considered to be something that um, was not a physical thing, but a mental thing. And that it was depression that kept you in bed and unwell rather than the other way around. And I have a very progressive um, mom who just said, that was nonsense. And it was the start of a journey that firstly, looking back, allowed me not to have to go to school, which by then I was really over. So I did a lot of my learning at home and actually did very well. But then also uh, I had the experience of having these horrendous headaches at that time. Nothing sorted it. No amount of drugs, like hardcore lidocaine patches, nothing helped. And my mom knew this guy who I now know actually wasn't qualified, had just started a bit of dabbling in Chinese medicine but he came over and put a needle in my head and this headache vanished. And it was like a little bit of like an aha moment. And there've been a few things in my life that have been that, but that little needle did more for me than so many drugs that I'd taken. And it was the beginning of a journey that led me to where I am now. Fantastic. So um, when you went off to university, um, what did you study? I studied history of art, as you do, because I had in my head that I was going to go into history of art and then I was going to be a lawyer that specialized in art because I've always loved art. But then after having had this experience of Chinese medicine, I got halfway through my first year and I said to my dad, dad, this is not what I want to do anymore. And of course, dad had a heart attack. Now is delighted, but had a heart attack back then. And I went and I trained as an acupuncturist while I was also doing, so I did a BSc in acupuncture at the same time as I did BA in art history Okay. because I had agreed with him I'd get a proper degree, quote, but I knew that when it came to the end of it, I wanted to be qualified and able to work. So I did both at the same time and I supported myself doing um, uh, supply teaching. I don't know if you have that there, but here you kind of go in and you sub in for or substitute teaching, you'd call it, isn't sure, it? Sure. Um, and so by the time I was done, I was ready to treat. Well, that's fantastic because a lot of people who get liberal arts degrees don't quite think about the employment uh, aspect after school. And so, you know, um, it's uh, very interesting to see a lot of people who got very niche, you know, here in the United States, very, very niche degrees in things that don't quite apply to like employment. You know, I, I have a niece who's a few years out of school and she has a, dan uh, a degree in folk dance. Well, where are you, what are you going to do with folk dance, right? And so she actually is involved in theater in the community she's at and doing awesome, but it doesn't set her forward to do something that's consistent and those types of things. So uh, you were very sage to get something that you could uh, actually get employed with. And we see a lot of people racking up student loan debt and don't have a way out. So it's, it's kind of crazy. So um, tell me a little bit about the first job that you stepped into after school. Well, the first job I had after school, and in fact, the last job I've ever had, was working as a secretary in an, a real estate agent while okay. I was building my practice, because the fact of the matter is I've always been self-employed. Okay. And these days, I see self-employment as a far more sure path to success than employment, because the world is changing so much. But I had that job, and the very last day of that job, I have to tell you, now Back then they didn't, because this is <laughs> a long time ago now, um, they didn't have camera phones. If I'd had a camera phone, I would have been set for life because my boss came in with a hole in his trousers and had unwrapped a big pack of chocolate bars and went around the office dropping chocolate bars out of the hole in his backside, making pooing noises. <laughs> and I had another one of those aha moments where I realized that this was not for me. And it was time I got my butt up off the seat and made a success of being self-employed. So I got up and I left and I never looked back. And that was the last time I really was employed in anything other than the job that I have always done now, 22 years of it. You know, now. it's a very sage observation. You know, a lot of people look at self-employment as uh, risky or highs and lows and those types of things. But, you know, if you're a go-getter and you're someone who's focused, it really is the stability because, you know, you're the one that controls your destiny. You know, you get up every day and you control your destiny. And I also agree with um, a lot of the things that are going on, the changes that are happening. And 
you know, on a global basis, because soon, soon I hope we're done talking about this, but the pandemic has, um, with all the lockdowns and the things that have happened, it's changed a lot of things for a lot of people, a lot of industries. I've been in tech for like 34 years and heck, we started doing work from home like 25 years ago. I mean, the minute there was internet and the minute there was, um, you know, laptop computers, you know, we were working anywhere. And so, but the pandemic has forced a lot of changes, a lot of businesses, a lot of industries. So when you opened your practice, okay, and you started building that out, what services were you first delivering? So here in the UK, when you qualify, you're like a, a general practitioner. You're sort of can treat a little bit of everything. Okay. Jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. And you right. sort of learn on your clients, right? Mm -hmm. And in my first year, I had a, a young woman come in to see me and she had been told that she was never going to be able to have children. Okay. And she'd had an IVF cycle and had become pregnant, but had very, very sadly lost her baby just before he was viable. And so when she came to see me, she was grieving and she was also preparing for her next IVF cycle. And I didn't really think anything of it. I didn't know back then what I know now. So I just went, okay, all right. So what I'm going to do is just treat what I see and help her feel great before she goes into her next IVF cycle. Right. And three months in, sorry, on her fourth month of treatment, because three is a very important uh, number in fertility, um, she fell pregnant. And her little boy is now 22 years old. Wow, and, that's, that's great. You know, so I have a lot of questions around what you're doing because I have a daughter who uh, recently, and we'll just put it that way, had a miscarriage, okay? And so I know you focus in, went, in helping women with this entire cycle. So um, do you do sort of help people with a little bit of preventive care for miscarriages or is it... Uh, therapy after or you know what are you doing around that um, specific niche within the whole fertility cycle I consider myself somewhat of a fertility detective so people okay. come to me at different stages of that cycle some of them do come these days to get ready to conceive but a lot of the time because of the the people I treat I treat women who are 38 to 45 I treat the really complex end of fertility issues so people okay. who have immunological problems or recurrent miscarriage or people who are transitioning and who want to do fertility preservation whilst managing their medication and so what I do is get them ready to conceive and we figure out why or what, what problems there may be or why they haven't conceived so far or or indeed if your daughter were to come to me to the best of our ability why might that miscarriage have happened now right. one miscarriage doesn't make an inevitability no. For sure. Um, one in four women would naturally miscarry as, as, as so they should, because sometimes eggs are not coming out as they should. And that's absolutely fine. And those things that happen. And so sometimes my job is just to help someone with the physical recovery and the grieving and, and kind of coming to terms with that process before they try again. But sometimes there are things that we can do. In fact, many times there are things that we can do, even with one miscarriage, when we can assess somebody's life and health, their hormonal, their metabolic, their immunological status, and we can see areas where we can improve things so they are in top shape before they try to conceive again. Fantastic. So um, what's the breadth of your, um, I guess, the whole comprehensive treatment, the way you approach it? Is it is it just the emotional side of things? Is there diet? Is there nutrition? Is there, um, you know, exercise? I mean, what's the breadth of when you're working with a client? Do, what are the subjects you cover? So I would do typically the intake. So I take about 90 minutes to talk to somebody and I pull apart every aspect of their life and their family life too, because we look at epigenetics and genetics. So we go back a couple of generations. Okay. So, for example, losing, using myself, my grandparents were in the Holocaust. So some of the issues I have had in my life that I've had to deal with health-wise have been as a result of that experience. Okay. So we have to look back further than their own life. And so we look through that. And then from that comes um, me pulling together a group of people who that client needs in order to get them where they need to go. Okay. So we might send for blood tests. We might send to a surgeon. So if it's male fertility, for example, we'd look at their prostate and we'd look at their testicles. If it's a woman, we might do uterine scanning. We might say if they have endometriosis, they might need a surgeon before we get to work. If they have 
trauma of any kind that is getting in their way, we may, we may work with them from an emotional point of view, either outsourcing to therapeutic or working with Chinese medicine on any of those areas. And a lot of the time what we do, what I am able to do is take all of the information from a biomedical point of view and translate it into Chinese medicine and treat okay. and then see the result from the biomedicine, which is the really important thing for me and the way I work. If I'm doing a blood test that shows a problem, then four months later, I want to redo that blood test and see that problem sorted out. Okay. So it's very so, much evidence-based work. Evidence-based work. So um, I don't know how to ask this question, so I'm going to try. In your your whole comprehensive treatment, um, and you do work uh, heavily with the acupuncture, how, is there a percentage? I, I don't know how to, to frame this. Is there a percentage? I mean, you know, when you look at that, you're going to help solve a lot of these things with the acupuncture. How much of acupuncture is what you're, you're doing? So I'm a herbalist as well as an acupuncturist. So I'd say in my own practice as a um, it's 50, 50 of each. Most people who come to see me are having the Chinese medicine as the basis for their treatment and I'm coordinating with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So they're not having to, they're not having to, to learn or carry that journey on their own. They have an informed partner with them and okay. advocate for them. And that's a really core part of what we do because this is a touchstone every week. I'm changing their acupuncture needles. I'm doing herbs for them. I'm talking to them about what is going on. We're adjusting as we go. And it has been many years since someone now has left my clinic without a baby at the other end of it. Wow. What I would say now is we don't always know how that baby is getting in. So sometimes it's natural conception. Sometimes we're supporting surrogacy. Um, when I'm supporting same-sex couples, it's a whole different sort of journey. They sure. are considered socially infertile. So for example, a lesbian couple have to go to a fertility clinic to obtain sperm in the UK. Sure. So the journey looks very different for everybody, mm -hmm. but it has been years since somebody's left a practice without a baby. There's always a reason why. And these days I don't accept a diagnosis of unexplained infertility anymore. So it's a very rewarding job to be in because over the years we've been able to figure out so many of the moving parts about how to keep someone well and healthy. And in many ways, I would say, I don't treat fertility at all. I treat health because from a healthy parent comes a healthy child. Okay. That's an amazing track record. Just about every time someone leaves with a baby. I mean, wow, that's incredible. So how do you deliver? Is it all in uh, your, your, um, your services? Is it mostly in person? And then are you, have you had to switch with the pandemic and do things, you know, virtual, um, you know, how do you deliver your services? Prior to the pandemic, everything in person. It's nice to see my clients. It's nice to be able to actually touch my clients' bodies, as dodgy as that sounds. Yeah. We learn a lot from being able to touch someone's abdomen, to feel the quality of their skin, to look at their face. That tells us a lot as practitioners. Um, over the pandemic, I switched to doing herb, being a herbalist online. So last year was all about the Zoom. Um, and I've got two young kids. So I have people I trained who saw my clients for me from an acupuncture point of view. But actually last week, I began to go back to treat again, which was amazing. And to actually see my clients again. So I'll be doing that back again um, from now on. Well, I was going to say, you know, for someone, you know, you can't virtually do acupuncture very well. I mean, that's, uh, and then here, right. in, here in the States, um, you know, it's been interesting because I, I'm a type two diabetic and I need to go and get checked every, you know, quarter, you know, to see where A1C is and those types of things. And you can't quite do that, uh, with a doctor in person, we had to get sent to labs and have them draw blood and, and, you know, well, those you say things. That. But in the UK, we have a fabulous service, which is you can order things through the post and you prick your finger and you put your blood in a little vial and you send it back through the post and including HbA1c, they can check it out. So wow. I was still able to order blood tests and work in the same way as I was before and have my markers just as a herbalist um, through the pandemic, which was awesome. Well, you're ahead of where my uh, the care providers I have because I'd have to trip over to some lab, wear all kinds of like bioprotection, get a blood sample and go on about my way and then do a telemedicine, you know, appointment, just like we're talking here today. So as a herbalist, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, is there an area that you, fo I mean, being a herbalist, that's a huge wide discipline because they're just so many herbs that can be applied to so many different 
I guess, ailments or need for treatment or preventive care, whatever. Is there a particular portion that you've really kind of narrowed in on as a specialist? Or are you very broad? So as a herbalist, you learn every herb in the Materia Medica. Um, if okay. I were to pull out a book, it would be this big. Yeah, huge. And so we have to be have to have internalized that okay. and then for me in my practice what I take from that is whatever herb I need to to get my clients where they're going to go so even though um, my my clients are still fertility and obstetric and I'm a herbalist for those clients so for example if I have a new mom with mastitis then I would be taking herbs from that materia medica, whichever one suits to make a formula to deal with the mastitis and to treat the mom and the baby. So it's still quite a niche area within uh, the work, but it's having learned everything and then narrowed it down to where I need to go. Well, you know, I, I, it's interesting. Um, I really believe in a comprehensive approach to medicine. Now I'm not an anti-pharmacologist, you know, I, I believe that there's a place for that. Um, but I also, I, you know, I want to look at herbs and supplements. I want to look at diet, diet. I want to look at exercise and sleep. Uh, recently just started on some CBD and have been able to catch up on sleep after years of insomnia type things. So, um, very interesting. How do you look at everything? Is it primarily a hundred percent from a herbalist and acupuncture? Give me what your view looks like. I have what I call my right hand women when it comes to the lifestyle side of it, okay. because what I do is really focused on sorting out the immune system and the hormones. Then I would say that for me to reach outside that in the time I have would be to do my patients a disservice. So I'm really conscious about where my sphere of expertise ends and other people around me who are their own <clears throat> experts come in. Sure. So I work hand in hand with functional medicine nutritionists. So I'll take a brief overview of their diet as part of my history, and I will see uh, what testing might need to be done. And then I'll work with a functional medicine nutritionist as a partner. So although the client um, might see myself and they might see the person I work with, whoever I pull together for that client's treatment, we all talk to each other about the client. So they're getting five, six okay. hands, whatever they need, all talking together about how to integrate their treatment in the simplest and most effective way for them. So it's, it's a big part of what we do. I think a lot of the time, if we were as a population um, healthier, able to access better quality food, um, taught how to eat it from a young age, able to access exercise that fills us with joy rather than is a task, yeah. all of those things being there, we'd be out of a job probably. Oh, yeah. The yeah. fact of the matter is that's part of the process of getting healthy is helping our clients feel the joy in their food and feel the joy in their movement and and to learn how to manage their stress and to learn how to deal with life in a way that really works for them. So that's part and parcel of what we do. So Nava, if you could, there, there are a lot of people who kind of play along with this when we do these interviews. Um, could you drop a website or your social media or, or any combination of those so people can find you uh, as we continue to talk? Of course. So I, uh, I'm in the UK. Um, I have a really long waiting list, so I will give you my website, but I recommend you find someone I trained. So my website is fertilitysupport.co.uk. And to find someone I've trained, you go to fertilitysupport.training. Okay. And you can find me on Instagram also at fertility support. So it's nice and easy to get hold of me. That's fantastic. So I want to uh, hopscotch over to um, going kind of back to the um the miscarriage situation, because one in, as you mentioned, one in four will experience that. So if somebody comes in and they've had a miscarriage and um, have those fears or trepidations about, you know, the next opportunity for that, um, what's the first thing you do when you talk to them? So we do a really good look around at basic female hormone panel if it's a woman coming in and well, I, I, when you, when you're asking me this question, I can almost see and feel your daughter as part of the conversation. So let's talk about what I do if I was to see her. So yeah, that's, a, that's where I was going. Yeah. And, but also too, <laughs> knowing that one out of four, that's a huge, yeah, a huge audience. That's a huge yeah. number. I mean, when you look at like autism, it's one in a thousand or something. So um, I just want to understand that because I think there's a lot of people listening today that could benefit from that. 
For sure. So we'd start off with looking at hormones. We'd look at on day two or three, the basic hormones for men and for women, I should say. We'd look at thyroid panels. We'd look at vitamins and minerals and what was going on there. Okay. We'd probably do a scan of the uterus and to check that there was nothing there that shouldn't be there. There was no evidence of endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, adenomyosis, fibroids or polyps, septum in the uterus, anything that's physically going to infect what's going on. Okay. And we'd also look at the men because they're 50% of it. And we participate, all of us, in a system which is very patriarchal and often, unfortunately, quite misogynist. So when miscarriages come up, the woman is looked at, but the man isn't. The man isn't, but they're 50% of the equation. So Mm. in my practice, what we do is we look at not just a semen analysis and we look at male hormones, but we check them out physically too. We check the testes and the prostate. And then we actually go a little bit deeper and we'd look at DNA fragmentation. So we'd actually look at the DNA of the sperm because we often find that there's a really big discrepancy between a sperm analysis and what we're seeing in terms of the DNA of the sperm. One can be perfect and the other one could be someone who is actually functionally infertile, but not be able to see that. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, we know that men with high levels of DNA fragmentation, their partners are not only less likely to to stay pregnant when they get pregnant, but they're more likely to have issues with offspring. So we really want to get both partners super duper healthy before they try again to conceive. And if we think there might be any genetic factors, we pick up autoimmune factors at this point, then we might take it a step further and do um, a blood test, a thromb- what we call a thromb- thrombotic panel. So we might look at blood clotting um, and gene factors that may be affecting the woman that could cause miscarriage. But we'd have to find something untoward, I think, for me to suggest we go down there. That's usually something that's done further along the line. Wow. You know, I'd never, never heard of this. Never. Um, you know, it's interesting. My daughter, um, both of her grandmothers um, have had miscarriages. Uh, mother didn't, but um, both grandparents, uh, grandmothers did. And anybody that I've heard of in the care never really talked about uh, the male side of it. You know, um, again, but just to be clinical here, a typical ejaculation is like a hundred million sperm that, that are released. So when you're looking at and then analyzing the male, I mean, of a hundred million sperm, is is sperm all equal? I mean, each sperm equal, or are there some that are genetically deformed? I mean, help me understand a little bit what you find when you're examining, you know, the the side of the male. Well, you're you're opening a bit of a rabbit hole here for me because this is something that I'm really passionate about is bringing that information, that education to the male side of fertility. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested. Okay, so brace yourself. Here it comes. (laughs) Okay, well, we'll go down this rabbit hole. I mean, it's so important. I've never heard this before. It's really super important. Okay, so a basic sperm test looks at the pH of the sperm, the liquefaction, the color of the sperm, the count. That's just the top line then ideally you'd have something called a swim up test. So you're not just checking the motility, which is how fast the sperm move, but you're actually challenging the sperm by putting it under a little bit of pressure in a beaker with different viscosity of medium. And you're actually seeing how many sperm are progressive, um, slow or immotile. So on the face of it, it can look fine, but you can end up with almost completely immotile sperm under challenge, which is sort of mimicking the internal environment of the woman, if you'd like. And then most importantly, you've also got what's called morphology, which is the shape of the sperm. Because sperm can have different shapes. It can have tail defects, head defects. And if a sperm isn't perfectly shaped, fertilization is going to be either impossible, difficult, or resulting in miscarriage or problems with the baby. And what is acceptable as a level of sperm abnormality now we are now 50, literally 50% of where we were 50 years ago. Wow. There's a fascinating book that's come out just in the last year by a professor called Shanna Swan called Countdown. You can read about this. Very accessible to the lay person, this book. But she has done a huge correlation of all of the studies that have been done around the world. And what we can see is that men are in big trouble sperm quality is declining to the point of really scary stuff. So sometimes in all of the huge count of sperm someone might have, only 1% of it is normal. And ideally we want 10% normal minimum. So there is a really big argument for men 
to look at their health in a very different way. But that opens up a really big argument from a societal and a cultural point of view too, because men traditionally are not people who look at their health. They're not necessarily in touch with their body. They're not people who go regularly to healthcare providers and, and take care of their health. They're not people who might look at, you know, their testicular health in terms of how warm everything is or whether their mobile phone is there heating things up or whether their laptop is there heating things up and on their lap. There is also a lack of understanding about the effect of the environment. So endocrine disrupting hormones, particularly in the form of plastics. So for example, I see men all the time walking around with plastic bottles that they just refill all the time and they sit in the sun and they refill them the next day. And as the plastics, and this is not woo woo stuff. This is like mainstream Western stuff. As the plastics leach into the water and you drink it, it disrupts things and it has an effect on the next generation. We know, for example, that if women are exposed in, in pregnancy, they are exposed to male child in pregnancy to certain points to these endocrine disrupting hormones that affects the male future fertility by shortening something called the anogenital gap. So, and actually a really very good way of assessing whether somebody from a male point of view is fertile is actually the gap between the testicle and the anus. And that is shortened when there are problems in utero or developmental or genetic problems. So there's a whole science and a whole world behind male fertility that needs to be examined, but it's not talked about. It's not happening enough. And because our system is geared to look at the woman as the carrier of the baby sure. and her sure. egg quality is the problem, that's ignored. Mm. So it's an interesting conversation to have because it involves re-education a lot of the time of what male men's expectations should be about fatherhood and their own health. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. Um... Going back to you, you made a comment earlier about the fact that certain sperm are have tail deficiencies, head deficiencies, you know, whatever. In helping men sort of equalize, is there a way to? Okay, first question: Is there a way, way to equalize or improve the entire spectrum of the sperm so there's a higher percentage of the ones that are good? and aren't causing, um, you know, defects or miscarriages? Is there a way to improve that? Exactly the same as we treat women, we treat men, and we can improve it right down, not just the sperm test, not just the autoimmune markers in the sperm, for example, but right down to seeing the DNA fragmentation resolve to the point of natural fertility being possible. Okay. So again, that's that testing before and after that we see. Okay. So the fragmentation now, are you help, are you treating that with acupuncture and herbs or what? Yeah. With acupuncture, with herbs, with nutrition, with stress improvement, with eliminating any physical impediment, with eliminating things called, often people have what's called varicose cells, which are tiny little bruises inside of the testicular testicular sac that aren't always visible on palpation, but can be found and treated with ablation. Mm -hmm. um, we do semen cultures and check if men are unwittingly carrying um, infections that they don't know about that are affecting their sperm production. Right. There's so many. And again, it's a spectrum for me, medicine. So we would use antibiotics if we needed, or we'd use herbs if that's what we needed. And we'd figure out what that person needed to get them where they needed to go in the fastest and the most efficient way. And we'd, and that's how I train everybody in my practice too. That's what we need to do to get them where they need to go. Well, that's fascinating. Um, again, I've never heard of this before. And I can't remember any time, you know, I guess there's a stereotypical, like we said before, there's a stereotypical uh, assumption or, you know, that there's something wrong with just the woman, right? There's something wrong in the, re I guess, the receptor side and the carrier side of this and not the, originator side. So it's fascinating um, to understand that, you know, there's a way to work both sides rather than just one. Um, and so I find that fascinating. That's really interesting. This has been a very enlightening conversation on that. So when couples come to you, is there a typical couple that comes to you um, or is it just all over the place? I think over the years I've niched down. So I'm really clear about the kind of couple I like to see. Mm -hmm. so when I first started, I was seeing, you know, sure. period pain or PMS or whatever it was. But now I want to see somebody who has been through the works, someone who's had many miscarriages or who has autoimmune conditions or who has had many failed IVF cycles or somebody who's kind of 
got to the point where they just don't even know what to do with themselves. And that's where I like to come in because right. especially if they're over 40, you know, I had my second child at 41, like practice what you preach. Yeah. But I really want to, to work with somebody who's, who's had a life, who's interesting and intelligent and complex and who I can really get my teeth into a case and unravel it and help to fix it up. And that's yeah. where I want to see and what I want to treat. Well, that's great. Uh, my daughter that had the miscarriage uh, is actually in medical school. So she is a sharp cookie. I mean, she knows her stuff and she's uh, somewhat practicing on the family now as far as, uh, well, hey, look at this or look at that or, hey, dad, you shouldn't be doing this or that kind of thing. So um, anyway, so it's it's really, I would imagine someone like that is really helpful to be able to receive and, and execute on the um, the treatments and, and your, your strategies. So you mentioned a little bit earlier about you've trained um, people under your discipline and what you've been doing. You, um, where are most of those people? Are they around the world? Are they mostly in the UK? Where have people... Uh, are landed that could provide this type of treatment? So I started training many years ago in person. Okay. And then actually very luckily before the pandemic, I'd moved everything online. Okay. So now we have a, a reach. We've just um, going, we've just had our first Australian graduate through the diploma, which is Fantastic. basically a, a big comprehensive um, 20 plus hour training that leads you with a diploma in advanced level fertility acupuncture and teaches you all the biomedicine and all the Chinese medicine you need to know to be that fertility detective. We've got people coming through in the States right now. Um, there's people in Holland, Spain coming through, New Zealand's just started. So we're spreading. Fantastic. Can you give out your website for, again, for both? Because, you know, I have listeners everywhere. <laughs> you know, Australia, to across the States, Africa, wherever. So give us the website where they can get trained and then also give us your website again for those who will be looking for those providers. And then is it best for them to find the providers off of your website or through the training website? So it's the same place. So fertility support training. They can access, if they're a practitioner who wants to train with me, with me, they can access the training there. If they want to find someone who I've trained with, they could also, there's a big find a practitioner sign there. So they can find someone, there's a map of the world and they can put in where they live and look where they they can find someone I've trained. Um, and there's about a hundred people coming through the pipeline. So over the next year, you should get a, a nice spread of, of practitioners starting to grow around the world. Oh, that's it. That is so exciting. I mean, I'm just thrilled to death to learn about well, it's especially, you know, I know you're doing great things with the women's side of things, but just to understand, you know, if, you, if you're having issues with fertility, you better look at everything, right? You know, the contributors. And I didn't ever understand, you know, I kind of thought that all sperm were equal, you know, it was just the race, you know, it wasn't the fact that there were some that had issues. And so that's, that's amazing. So what's next in, in this field? What's next on the horizon that you see? Well, at the moment, I'm concentrating on growing that training base. That's a really big thing for me. So I have um, sort of turned my eye less to practicing. So I'm, I'm accepting a fairly limited number of clients now. And really, I feel that I've kind of stepped into my life's work with trying to reach as many practitioners as possible with the way I work because it's so effective. and. Mm -hmm. Part of that is also offering a supportive community for practitioners that we have where we talk about things and they renew access to that community, not by paying me money, but by committing to 30 hours of high level continuous professional development every year that they show me. Okay. And so we have this group where we, we, we do professional development as a group every month, as well as stuff we do on our own. We talk about cases, we support each other in practice. And I do a lot of masterminding and business mentoring with practitioners to help them get the business side up because no matter how fantastic you are as a practitioner, if your onboarding systems aren't working or if your communication isn't good or if you can't serve your clients in other ways or if you're not even able to be found by people, yeah, then you can't be the practitioner. You know, passion alone won't get you there. So I'm spending a lot of time at the moment looking at the business side of things and helping practitioners make it okay in, within themselves to charge for their expertise because there's often a conflict between the caring profession and monet the monetary side. So I want to bring those two together. And that's and a big passion of mine at the moment. That's, a, that's great. I mean, you've, I think it's probably like a lot of disciplines in medicine. There's so many ways to look at it now. I mean, you know, it used to be, you know, when I grew up, um, 
throw me some meds and pat me on the butt out the door, whatever the ailment happened to be. And I just think that there's so many, um, I guess it would say, elements of progress in, in care and in healthcare. I mean, I, in some of my ailments, um, sleep is so important. You know, it's just, it's huge. It's such an impact because if you're not getting enough rest, <laughs> you're not working at your high performance. And so I just think that's a, you know, a holistic look at things is really important. Um, this is fascinating. I really have enjoyed our conversation today because I think what you're doing is amazing to help get the education out there. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing this with us. Um, Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Now, there's one last question that I ask all my guests, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is a question that's kind of a left-handed question. So well, every... that's good because I'm left-handed. Okay. Well, then you maybe you'll catch this one good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in our Western cultures, uh, we have the thing called a bucket list. And in fact, I have actually interviewed the bucket list guy. He's from Melbourne, so you might ha you have a connection there. His <laughs> name is Trav Bell, one of the most interesting guys, one of the best uh, episodes I've ever done, uh, episode number 60. So uh, I'll plug that one for Trav because he does amazing things about living purposefully. So anyway, that bucket list, of course, things we want to do before our time on Earth is done. But there's always an opposite of everything in the universe, okay? That opposite list is things we don't want to do or have no interest in or don't want to do again. Now that list um, rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, okay? So the F it list is how we would kind of uh, explain that one. And so you've shared so much with us about your education, your pivot points, the things you're doing. This tells us a little bit about you. And so what might be an item or two that would be on your F it list? So while you um, think about that, I'll give you a couple exam examples. I will never have a collection of pet snakes. That just isn't going to happen. I'm uh, not going to eat any more sardines. Nope. Been there, done that. Uh, caviar, you can put that in that same bucket. Nope. Not doing that again. Uh, and then the last one is um, I'm never going to do another Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. The idea of um, excessive heat, excessive humidity, um, drumming and chanting all at the same time and a slight little bit of nudity. Uh, I have no interest in doing that again. So um, Nava, what might be an item or two that would be on your effort list? I'm not gonna do it. It's interesting you should ask that question because I've actually been thinking about this. It's kind of like the lessons learned thing, yes. isn't it? Yes, it is. And so there are two things I would say. First, I'm never going to not speak my mind and what I think is right anymore. Okay. And I think that that has been a process of me as a woman getting older and more confident in my voice. Um, and I sort of stepping into my power, if you like, and my, my knowledge of, of what I know in my life. So I'm never again going to be quiet in the face of things that I know to be right for me. Mm -hmm. my family. And the second thing on that list is about living or practicing really consciously. Um, I think learning uh, the world has opened up for us in so many ways in the last couple of years and the ability for us to learn about how people live differently to us is so important. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned about cultural competency and about the different ways I need to work as a practitioner with racial, sexual, gender, socioeconomic minorities and the consciousness with which I bring to my practice with those things I think I will never again practice unconsciously, unaware okay. of the needs of those people. All right. So that's really good stuff. Okay. But you're being too uh, professional here. All right. So those are great, um, amazing uh, bucket list items. So I got to give you some flack here. Okay. How about something just similar? Like, I don't want to hang out with mice in my house or <laughs> I don't... I don't like skim milk or, you know, things like that. What might a little more personal. I mean, I love your, your professional stuff. I get all that. Okay. And your higher level, but come on, Nava, how about something that's just a little more trivial, like my, I'm not eating sardines. Well, I'm five foot. So I'm never again going to drive a car that isn't a four by four. <laughs> okay. Which includes sports cars. Never again. Been there, okay. done that, done with that. <laughs> and I'm uh, never again going to eat boiled beetroot. Okay, boiled beetroot. That's a first I've that ever heard. That is not my thing. This is an English thing, like pickled boiled beetroot. That is not my, and pickled onions too. Not my thing. Not your thing. 
Well, thanks for being so open with you and being able to uh, to put up with my teasing. So I appreciate <laughs> that you uh, you did. Thank so, you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, nice to have authentic um, guests who bring us amazing education. So one last time, if you could, uh, drop us your website uh, links, and then we'll wrap it up. To find me as a practitioner, go to fertilitysupport.co.uk. To find anyone I've trained or to train with me, fertilitysupport.training. And to find me on Instagram, at fertilitysupport. Fantastic. All right, folks, uh, we're grateful to have Nava with us today. And so we want to thank her. And then I also recommend, in addition to her websites, please stop by and visit her. Um, all of her links and bios are there. And then also please stop by the show website because we have uh, information about her and any and all of our guests, whether they're upcoming or they've been on the show, uh, we try to provide information about that. So until next time, I will say what I say after every episode. Some of this has been influenced by things in the last year. Be safe, but be bold and make it a great day. <laughs>